Welcome to the Teacher's Toolkit for Literacy, the free podcast for motivated teachers and school leaders who want to inspire their students and school community in literacy learning. Make sure you subscribe to the show on your favourite podcast player, and for more amazing literacy resources, check out the show notes provided with every episode. Hi, I'm Sharon, and I'm the host of a Teacher's Toolkit for Literacy. In every toolkit episode, we bring you specific resources, tools, strategies, tips, techniques to help you in your job as a teacher of literacy. Firstly, we acknowledge and pay our respects to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians whose ancestral lands we gather on. We acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and relationship of the Ghana people to country, and we respect and value their past, present and ongoing connection to the land and cultural beliefs. And welcome, Phil. And welcome, everyone, to another podcast, and this time with Sharon. Hi, everybody. Nice to be back. This time, with it's just a, a you and me, Phil. Yeah, we haven't done that for a while, but no. we've had some really great podcasts together oh. with great guests. Haven't we? Mm. Like That is the joy of our work, is how many people, how many teachers, how many leaders, how many mm. educators we get to work with. On an ongoing basis, you know, people with or from whom we are learning Mm. so much, Mm. but, you know, together doing, you know, this rich professional (laughs) exploration. Yeah. Yeah. And I hope our audience, um, it's great if you're staying with us on all these podcasts because there's a progression, isn't there? And there's a connecting between them. We've got similar themes coming across those podcasts. And today will be just another podcast that connects to all that work yeah um and before we go on uh sharon i'd just like to say i think one of the really powerful pieces of these podcasts is you're working face to face in these schools um in a wide range of schools in victoria south australia and western australia but we're sharing what we've found out from those schools with everybody, this wider audience, so we all mm. benefit from that work. Um, it's not just you working in those schools. It's um, many, many teachers can now, we can share that, what we're discovering uh, with all those teachers. Yes, yeah, I agree. I hope that is um, valuable because I know just with the teachers that we are working with and the schools, those communities, I really understand the importance of those conversations and that professional growth that we're all making Mm. during Mm. those times. You know, that we, that it's in those noticings that schools are making that we then really set forth on those inquiry processes of, okay, this is what we're noticing. How can we, what is it that we can do that can improve, can lift? can make better those things and I think what the podcasts are really also trying to do is not only sharing in those things that schools are trying to do but also sharing in some of the processes that they undertake that I hope other schools can find useful in Mm. thinking about oh all right we're we're experiencing or we've noticed that same sort of thing Mm. Here's a way that we might be able to move on that or inquire about that or be curious about that, that in our own school. And that can be at a leadership level and it also can be at a classroom level, can't it? So there's oh, different yes. levels that we yeah. can come in on this. And we we do in these podcasts really focus on the teacher in the classroom and the tools yeah. and strategies and techniques that they can use. But, you know, there's a leader who's leading this and they're vital to yeah, the whole Yeah, that's... That's a really good point, mm. that it isn't just about whole school. Yep. It is about from teacher to teacher, from what we as the professional in the class mm. um, is noticing and you know, sometimes teaching can be an isolating profession because we yep. don't always get that opportunity mm. to reflect or to be prompted to reflect on those things. We are so busy Mm, mm. and busy in glorious and demanding ways. But in that reflection, you know, in the bit of time that people sit and listen, or maybe you're not sitting, maybe you're vacuuming, maybe maybe you're walking, maybe you're travelling, 
um, that in that time of just sitting, that there are ways, you know, that we talk about things that allow people that luxury of being reflective and having some opportunity to think about their own teaching and their own learning. So, Sharon, uh, just a bit of a roundup of uh, what you've been up to lately. Oh, well, with each of the schools that I've been working with, mm. um, each school really has, like, this is the joy and the thrill. And I think the wondrous curiosity that schools have and that there is that real privilege to work with schools in that way is the schools in their noticing or teachers in their noticing because actually I want to come back to that. It isn't just about schools. Um, so specifically with some schools that you've done this work with noticing with teachers, haven't you? Yes, yeah. yeah. And and so it may not be – all teachers might not have the same thing that they are noticing, mm. wondering about, mm. but of course all of it leads to how are we across – Reading, writing, word work, spelling. How are we um, moving our children in a collective kind of way? Not in an isolate, let's just address this without addressing other things. Mm. Um, so I suppose, wow, this is a ramble. Um, but it's such big work that people are doing. It's such mm. big questions Mm. that people are wondering about. So maybe if I just share some of the things that yeah, um, sure. we're talking about. So actually I'm going to talk about one school in particular today. Mm. Um, they've noticed, so looking at some of the standardised assessments that they've been doing, they've noticed that their students are really, and I'm talking about um, our year three up yep. students, really good at decoding but are choosing not to read. Interesting. So, and I love how they've looked at that information to then be able to identify. So I wasn't sitting with them to look at that information, but they could look at that. Mm. So I'm not saying I'm the be-all and end-all. I'm just saying I mm. love that in our relationships with schools, that that's what are our partnerships with schools. They say, okay, this is what we're noticing. This is what we're curious mm. to address. So a bit of a problem's been identified that the kids are just not um, engaged with their reading. Correct. They can decode, okay. Yes, yeah. yeah. So then in another school, so let me just talk about a particular teacher who's asked the big question about where am I getting the time for children to really be reading the books that are going to grow them the most so that that well-matched, and we're talking about a junior primary year level, you know, how can I really give good solid time, you know, to that daily work with those texts that are um, that are right for them to help them grow as very, you know, as early and emergent readers. Um, then we have schools talking about the bigger picture planning, really, really refining their planning to really get great connectedness through that reciprocity of reading and writing. And so how do we plan in a way um, – and and we're a long way down the track with that school. Like the planning that those teachers are now doing and those big – but they're always ready for that next – right, got this going now. Now what can I add to that – and, you know, we might have talked about this before, but I haven't quite integrated that part in yet. Um, how can I now bring that in? Because I'm seeing the impact, but now I think I can get even more impact if I can now bring that element in that we were talking about. Yeah, so planning's a really critical thing and um, it's, um, you know, at the start of a term that they're planning and it's day by day. It's yeah, all or sorts of things. So as we're recording this, it is at the end of one of our school terms here yep. in Australia. Yep. And so I have spent over the last two weeks, you know, I've spent five full days with schools, with teachers planning for their next term. 
And that planning time, so that might be with teachers individually or in their year level grouping, this idea of them coming with, and and I'm going to say these are all schools that have got good, I'm going to say good frameworks in place about the how they're working and they've got some good plans in place for the what they're covering across the year. So when teachers come to these planning sessions, they're coming already with, all right, so this is... For instance, they might have a topic that they're yeah, working on. Yeah, so it might yeah. be really a, the unit. Right, so the, that's over the, a number of weeks. Yeah, yeah. so five weeks or so. Yeah. You know, the unit, their English unit. So they'll, they already know what kind of writing they want their children to engage with. that's been mapped out over the whole year. Um, you know, they're doing this mapping in sections, aren't they? And then, yeah, yep. and, and by mapping we're talking about all right, over a year we, we know we want to cover these types of writing yep. in five-week blocks. Yep. The order that they go in is always dependent on the teacher making that decision. So it isn't a set order that mm. the school's putting down, but we're saying at this year level, this range of um, yep. types of text that we want to do. And that, it, that planning becomes so exciting because then we've got, you know, a group of teachers there and in one group yesterday, it was the absolute joy of two pre-service teachers in there as well who were on placement. And so there's six of us sitting together mapping out the plan. So we're towards the end of the year. So what haven't we covered? So we're looking back at the curriculum. What areas haven't we covered? In writing, so even though we know the topic, what aspects of writing and from the writing that we're noticing students doing, what do we want to bring in to that? Um, And people are coming with all of that documentation. It's not just, oh, I come and, you know, the two of us sit together and we talk about planning. It is teachers bringing their rich, rich, rich professional knowledge about what students have been doing, where they now are, what's now, where they see next step. And it's each teacher, we're not doing, okay, now all teachers are going to be doing this same thing. It's all teachers working out, right, for my class, this, for my class, that. So it's according to the needs of their learners. Yeah. And there is just such great professional voice in there, teacher agency, about that and it is such a privilege to be in those conversations with teachers and it is that real model of with this isn't just that gradual release of I'm doing all the two right this is what you're doing this is we're withing (laughs) you know we are doing Mm. this together um and teachers really making powerful decisions about this is what will be right for my children. This is what will be right for mine. And so building these big and rich units that are quite and, – and I will use the example of two early career teachers who I spent um, planning time with them this week. And this is the second lot of planning that I've done for these teachers – So at their request, could they plan their next unit because the planning of the previous unit was so highly successful for them and they were able to really notice the things that what we would call the striving students, what they achieved, what they were able to because because they we got it right, and I'm going to say we, we got it right knowing what to look for, where to find the entry points for them, not only at a school level but at an engagement level. Right, yep. So, you know, this highly successful poetry unit that was done Mm, mm. or poetry unit that was planned, delivered and achieved by students, you know, every child creating their own poetry anthology. We're talking about year two, threes and fours and 
what's more, we're going to have them podcasting with us <laughs> you yes, know, yeah. at a later stage yeah. to talk more about that. So anyway, I've over-talked that bit now, Phil. About no, that's the, okay. Um, um, I guess we don't want to do a roundup of our um, other things that are going on in our lives. At the what? Moment. what? What's that, Father of the Bride? <laughs> oh, um, a wedding? <laughs> <laughs> I know. How joyous is this, you know, that we are two weeks out from... You know, the wedding of our daughter and our gorgeous daughter and our gorgeous-to-be son-in-law. Yeah, yeah. And the joy of family and love in all of that. Mm, that mm. Oh. No, there's so many so <laughs> many uh, parts of it that have been so joyous and uh, the lead-up to it and then when we actually have it, it's going to be wonderful. So. Yes, I know. We yeah. probably could have had podcasts just on weddings, to yeah, be honest. <laughs> Or wedding tips. <laughs> wedding tips, yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway, um, look, um, so today, Sharon, the title, Blessing the Book, where does that title come from? Good question and such a great title. We've taken the title from a phrase that has been coined by the late Linda Gambrill. Late and great. The late and great. Linda Gambrill has been an enormous influence in my life as an educator. And um, she has, August the 5th, 2024, we lost Linda Gambrill. Mm -hmm. She has left the richest legacy to us as educators and... And it's a legacy that for 40 years we have just, generations of teachers have benefited from this, but it will be ongoing. And calling this session, this podcast, Blessing the Book, um, is a way for us to really explore her work has really spanned the three big areas of literacy that she has explored and written about and researched are literacy motivation, reading comprehension and the role of discussion in teaching and learning. Mm. So she has many publications. We've already done one podcast that has absolutely highlighted her work and that was on motivation to read and we've referenced an article by her that you can um, – we'll mm. reference these podcasts in the show notes. But mm. Seven Rules for Engagement – or the sorry, The Seven Rules of Engagement. And I will make reference briefly again to that in this podcast. Um, the, literacy, the Literacy Research Handbook. Right. Which she has brought to us – To be honest, I can't tell you how many, but over a number of years, especially when she was the president of the International Literacy Association, um, a number of editions of that literacy research handbook has been brought to us and that just spans an incredible range of researchers and educators in that. And not that long ago, her book published with... Barbara Marinac, called No More Reading for Junk, was another nod to reading motivation. So why do we have children reading? It shouldn't be for that extrinsic motivation. It should be for intrinsic motivation. She's not saying all extrinsic motivation is bad, but how do we build that intrinsic motivation? But the phrase that she coined... Blessing the book, that's what I really want to explore today, its role in motivation and engagement. And so I want to be able to talk a little bit about a revisit and an explore of a school really taking that idea of motivation and engagement and how they've really been intentional about that. One of the schools you're working in? Yes. South Australia? Uh, Victoria. Victoria, yep. Yeah. Okay. Look. It's the Victorian school making it highly intentional. Mm. The schools I work with in South Australia and Victoria are all highly aware. And Western Australia. And Western Australia have it at the forefront of their minds. Mm. 
but here is a school making a very intentional intentional because it has been one of their noticings. Yep. Yeah. So teachers need to bless the book. Yes, that is her phrase. In fact, she said it in many different ways, but teachers need to bless the book and then the children will read it. Right. So blessing the book. We'll talk we'll more talk a lot more about mm. um and in fact we will also do some blessings of the book again. Not only has Linda Gambrell been someone that we've really showcased her work and mm. that can easily be accessed by people, but we've also had two great book lovers, booksellers in Genevieve and Rebecca. Genevieve from Where the Wild Things Are bookshop in Brisbane and Rebecca, who was with Peggy Williams Books here in Adelaide, um, have blessed many books for us and they're good podcasts to go back to if you're ever looking for okay, some we'll book have, recommendations. We'll have some links on those. Yes. Yeah. So should we go a little bit deeper into what the teaching struggle is here that we're trying to address? You know, what, yeah. what are teachers noticing or having struggles with? Yeah. So, number one, motivation and engagement. They're the words teachers will often use with me. My, you know, we're my, not, kids aren't my children engaged. aren't engaged. They're not reading. Or mm. they, they may be reading, but we can see they may be fake reading. Yeah. They may be looking at different books every day and I know that they are not – so teachers may be noticing – what's the teaching struggle? Maybe noticing children, you know, are decoding the book but aren't thinking about the book. Right. So haven't or aren't checking that they are understanding the book. And so there is that level of, yeah – they read the book, so maybe in a conference with them or in talking with them about books or in children, in class discussions, we realise, yes, they've decoded, but they are actually not understanding what they're reading. Mm. Then we've got children who are reading as a school task but not choosing to read. So the engagement outside of school isn't happening or even at school Many teachers will say children certainly aren't reading outside of school and so their reading isn't growing at school and, you know, have we got enough time at school for them to be reading? So then there's that whole idea of are we enabling our children to know how to choose books, how to find books, how to have access to books then we've got children who are, if we have got them reading at school, that they are struggling to find the book to read. Then we might also just be noticing children are not loving reading, let alone choosing to read. They're not even loving reading. It is a school chore or it is a something that has to be done, so therefore I don't get the engagement. So they are some of the, they are the common things that I hear teachers talking about and teachers are wanting to address because they feel like, you know, a lot of the teaching that they are doing is or getting students to levels of decoding or fluency or accuracy but not to the levels of enjoyment, understanding. Which is really the thing that will keep them going with their reading, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's that, it's that glue that's going to take them right through to high school that says, you know, I want to keep going with this. I love it. I love yeah. doing it. Yeah. I think there's something really important for us to think about as teachers, and Linda, you know, gets us to this point, but what is reading for? And how do we construct that as teachers? In our Australian curriculum, it's divided into literacy, literature, language. And we need the working with print components of reading. We need the noticing how the text works and the language and structure of language. But we also need that affective side, that 
What are our preferences? What are our opinions? How do we respond to? Because actually writers write not to teach us how to read but to how to be. Writers write to help us learn more about our world, ourself and others. Not that no writer is sitting down going, okay, how am I best going to teach children how to read? <laughs> like no bike builder builds a bike. How am I best going to teach a child how to ride a bike? It's about we want children, yes, we want them working with print effectively and efficiently and accurately. Yes, we want children to be fluent, expressive, you know, using intonation, phrasing, to get to the meaning of the text, to what is it that our, what is it that this writer is bringing to us? And I think that's sort of the essence of what Linda Gambrell talks about is what is it about this book that is worth blessing? Yep. And, and that's where I think the blessing lies. It's critical, not in its, all right, this book, I'm going to bless this book because it's at your level mm. <laughs> or it's at, um, like that's not motivating. No. But motivation is about why is this book? So what, important. Why is this book important? What's this bringing? Why is this book good for you? What about this? So... I just really wanted to get in that. Mm. that um, it's kind of vital, really. The connection to, mm. and it's written all over our curriculums. Mm. So working with the schools and the teachers, we're going to share with people today yeah. some things that you've been doing that make these things work. Yes. And maybe I should, rather than going through all of these things, because otherwise it's going to turn into the eternal podcast, mm. um, I'm going to actually just remind us what the seven rules of engagement are so that I can use the seventh one to really lead us into the work that we've been trying to do. Oh, that's good. Yep. All right. Yep. So can I also just say this is an entirely succinct and such a valuable article because not only does Linda talk about the seven rules – but then she lists classroom tip for helping students with that. And so there's a lot of things in those tips that we've used with schools to really drive down that motivation. So these can't be underestimated as really, you know, I really recommend people also go back to that podcast yeah. to um, to explore that. But first one. So let's hear the, mag yeah. the Magnificent Seven. Number one, students are more motivated to read when the reading tasks and activities are relevant to their lives. So what's a tip? One of my favourites of all time, have students keep a reading diary. Yep. We mm -hmm. offer a reading calendar Yep. as part of, and I will reference right now that that is with um, this one school that I'm talking about in particular that's really driving down engagement and motivation. They have now designed a school reading calendar based on the one that we've offered on Teachific that includes their space for a day-to-day -day record of what I've read how many pages I've read, you know, which pages I've read, and I'm talking about this for year three up. Um, and I'll mention this one later on, but also on there, the reading goals. But they've made it a school document. They've made that a school tool, a resource. So they put their school logo on it and make yes. it their school resource. That's yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And so now that becomes... That is one of their reading tasks and activities is to keep a reading diary. She also suggests that they might reflect and write, just do a quick jot about their reading for, you know, about how they're reading that day connected to their own lives. Um, 
or whatever their goal might be, you know, to reflect on how did I use my reading goal today. But if reading is the motivation, this is one of the mm. – um, or if motivation is the goal, mm. this is one of the ways to drive that without it being a separate lesson, without it being – but this is the tool to help that happen. So number two, students are more motivated to read when they have access – to a wide range of reading material. Her research also shows children in classrooms with classroom libraries read 50% more. Mm. So in her book with Barbara Maranak, they talk about reading motivation being built on three pillars, access, relevance and choice. And they refer to that as the ARC Framework, ARC, Access, Relevance, Choice. And that's important to hold that thought for blessing of the book or blessing a book because is that book, have they got access to it? Is it there? Because I should be blessing things that are. Is it relevant? How is it relevant? So relevance So if I'm bringing a book to a child to bless, how is it relevant to them? Mm -hmm. So I think I mentioned before, it's not just, oh, because it's at your level. Mm. No, because Mm. of why. Okay. A a tip for number two? Tip for number two um, is to increase student access to a wide range of reading material. And that's one of the things that I love in the schools that I'm working with who have got classroom libraries in there. They are always thinking about what have they got in there for their students. They don't have a classroom library that begins at the beginning of the year and stays static. And I think we've had Giselle on talking about her classroom library, this idea of bringing in things along the way. Great teacher working with who has year five to nine students that she's working with. Most weekends she's out book browsing, often in, um, you know, at book sales, etc. But she's always got her children in mind. She Mm. might put a book on her desk at the beginning of the next week and someone will notice that book, particularly the child who she's actually had in mind to notice just by buying it, just by putting it there, it's blessed and brought to. So access... Relevance, choice, that? Um, but that extending that range of materials. Yep. This time of year, this is another little tip, you know, I often talk to year sixes who are moving into secondary school, you know, to say, all right, what haven't they had access to yet? What can you bring in and really extend for the last term of the year, Mm -hmm. what kinds of books like intentionally bring in from the classroom library or from those remaining dollars of your classroom budget for books, what books can I bring in and give them access to but bless them by bringing them in? And we'll take a break there from part one of our podcast. We look forward to you joining us for part two. Bye for now. for listening to the podcast to make sure you don't miss any literacy learning tips and insights please subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast player at q learning our literacy specialists draw on over 30 years of teaching and international consulting experience to deliver world-class learning solutions we equip empower and support teachers to become their authentic selves to find out about upcoming webinars and about how Q can help you and your school, visit qlearning.com.au. And you can get even more amazing teaching resources right now at teachific.com.au. Stay tuned.